again. So I'm just going to continue reading from Art and Fear by David Bales. And uh, the next uh, section is headed Art and Science. So I'm looking forward to reading what this says. Okay. It is an article of faith among artists and scientists alike that at some deep level, their disciplines share a common ground. What science bears witness to experimentally, art has already known intuitively. That there is an innate rightness to the recurring forms of nature. Science does not set out to prove the existence of parabolas or sine curves or pi. Yet, wherever phenomena are observed, they, there they are. Art does not weigh mathematically the outcome of the brushstroke, yet whenever artworks are made, archetypal forms appear. Charles Eames, Eames when asked how he arrived at the curves used in his famous uh, moulded plywood chair, was clearly baffled that anyone would ask such a question. Finally, he just shrugged and replied, it's in the nature of the thing. I'm going to use that one. Some things, regardless of whether they are discovered or invented, ooh, reinvent you, um, simply and assuredly feel right. What is natural and what is beautiful are, in their purest state, indistinguishable. Could you improve upon the circle? Not sure what that means. In the day-to-day -day world, however, improving the circle is different from, say, improving the wheel. Science advances at the rate that technology provides tools of greater precision, precision, while art advances at the pace that evolution provides minds with greater insight, a pace that is, for better or worse, glacially slow. That's the what's that's what the book says. Um, I like to believe it's a, um, at a good pace, or at least better than glacially slow. Thus, while the stone tools fashioned by the cave dwellers of ice and ice age ago are hopelessly are hopelessly primitive by current technological standards, their wall paintings remain as elegant and expressive as any modern art. And while a hundred civilizations have prospered, sometimes for centuries, without computers or windmills or even the wheel, none have survived even a few generations without art. All that all that is not meant to cast art and science into some sort of moral foot race, but simply to point out that in art as well as science, the answers you get depend on the questions you ask. Where the scientist asks what equation would be best to describe the trajectory of an airborne rock, the artist asked, asks what it would feel like to throw one. The main thing to keep in mind, as Douglas Hofstadter noted, is this, that science is about classes of events, not particular, particular instances. Art is just the opposite. Art deals in any one particular rock with its welcome vagaries. It's an interesting new word. It's peculiarly... I'm so sorry. Yo. In its peculiarities of shape, its unevenness, its noise. The truths of life as we experience them and as art expresses them include random and distracting influences as essential parts of their nature. Theoretical rocks are the province of science. Particular rocks are the province of art. The richness of science comes from the really smart people asking precisely framed questions about carefully controlled events, controlled in the sense that such random or distracting influences don't count. The science scientists, if asked whether a given experiment could be repeated with identical results, would have to say yes, or it wouldn't be science. I don't know whether that is quite right. Please 
comment if uh, or what you think or to correct because um, I'm not sure. Um, the presumption is that at the end of a scientific experiment, neither the researcher nor the world have changed. And so repeating that experiment would necessarily reproduce the same result. Indeed, anyone performing the experiment correctly would get the same result, a circumstance that on occasion leads to multiple claims for the same discovery. But the artist, if asked whether the, an art piece could be remade with identical results, would have to answer no, or it wouldn't be art. In making a piece of art, both the artist and the artist's world are changed, and re-asking the question facing the next black, blank canvas will always yield a different answer. This creates a certain paradox, for while good art carries a ring of truth to it, a sense that something permanently important about the world has been made clear, the act of giving form to that truth is arguably unique to one person and one time. There is a moment for each artist in which a particular, tr particular truth can be found, and if it is not found, then it will not ever be. No one else will ever be in a position to write Hamlet. This is pretty good evidence that the meaning of the world is made, not found. Our understanding of the world changed when those words were written, and we can't go back, any more than Shakespeare could. The world thus altered becomes a different world, with our alterations being a part of it. The world we see today is a legacy of people noticing the world and commenting on it in forms that have been preserved. Of course, it's difficult to imagine that horses had no shape before some, someone painted their shape on the cave walls. But it is not difficult to see the world became a subtly larger, richer, more complex and meaningful place as a result. Self-reference. Self-reference, repetition, parody, satire. Art is nothing, if not incestuous. Witnessed Isha's drawing of hands, drawing hands. 20th century artists made self-reference pretty much its stock in trade. Paintings about painting, writings about writing. Moreover, most Every piece of art quotes itself, calling out its own name through rhythm and repetition. Music offers uh, the clearest examples, like Beethoven building the first movement of his fifth symphony just around just four notes, but all media having their equivalents. When not quoting itself, artworks even pay homage to art that preceded them. Shostakovich's masterful viola sonata, opus 147, quotes Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, wrapping the tune around itself, drawing attention to itself, drawing attention to something else. At the less reverent level, this becomes satire and parody, as in Woody Allen's Play It Again, Sam. An operation like, for instance, applying paint says something not only about itself, but about all the other applied paint as well. Rembrandt's work looks different, the paint more deliberately applied after you've seen Jackson Pollock's. It looks even more different after you've applied paint yourself. Our understanding of the past is altered by our experiences in the present. Turning the reference point inward, it's apparent that at some level, all art is autobiographical. After all, your brush only paints a stroke in response to your gesture. Your word process only taps out a sentence in response to your keystrokes. As Tennessee Williams observed, ev even works of demonstrable fiction or fantasy remain emotionally autobiographical. John Swarovski once curated... Swarovski... Blah, blah. Swarkowski, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm not pronouncing these things quite right, but I just, you know, don't practice the reading before I read it, and um, I seek to improve, so, yeah. Curated a show at the Museum of Modern Art that titled Mirrors and Windows. 
his premise was that some artists view the world as if looking through a window at things happening out there, while others view the world as if looking in the mirror at a world inside them, inside themselves. Either way, the autobiographical vantage point is implicit. If art is about itself, the widely accepted corollary is that art that art making is about self-expression. And it is, but that is not necessarily all it is. It may only be a passing feature of our times that validating the sense of who you are is held up by the major source of the need to make art. What gets lost in that interpretation is an older sense of what art is, something you do out of the world, or something you do about the world, or even something you do for the world. I like that one. The need to make art may not seem s stem solely from the need to express who you are, but from the need to complete a relationship with something outside of yourself. As a maker of art, you are a, you are a custodian of issues larger than self. Some people who make art are driven by inspiration, others by provocation, still others by desperation. Art making grants access to worlds that may be dangerous, sacred, forbidden, seductive, or all of the above. It grants access to worlds you may otherwise never fully engage. It may even, may in fact, be the engagement, not the art, that you seek. The difference is that making art allows, indeed guarantees, that you declare yourself. Art is contact, and your work necessarily reveals the nature of that contact. That's, that's pretty profound. I'm going to read that again. Art is contact, and your work necessarily reveals the nature of that contact. In making art, you declare what is important. <clears throat> Metaphor. <laughs> so a Zen teaching is quoted here. When you start on a long journey, trees are trees, water is water, and mountains are mountains. After you have gone some distance, trees are no longer trees, water no longer water, mountains no longer mountains. But after you have traveled a great distance, trees are once again trees, water is once again water, and mountains are once again mountains. I'm pretty sure that John Bebeke has said that like a thousand times, but I'm also a little bit not sure. So let me know, but I, you know, I instantly think of John when, and it's like, it says there, Zen teaching. So he knows like everything about that. So yeah, anyway. Making art of... I wonder if he's read this book. He probably has. Okay. I mean, I stand corrected, but... Making art depends upon noticing things. Things about yourself, your methods, your subject matter. Sooner or later, for instance, if every visual artist noticed the relationship of the line to the picture's edge. Okay, relevance, realization, through line. Uh, <laughs> like, okay. I'm getting excited now. I'm gonna go watch a rewatch a video of John's. It's hard to find ones that I haven't um, heard or seen. By the way, you should de definitely check out um, his uh, new range of books. Um, I'm saying that because I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> Before that moment, the relationship does not exist. Afterwards, it's impossible to imagine it not existing. And from that moment on, every new line talks back and forth with the picture's edge. People who have not yet made this small leap do not see the same picture as those who have. In fact, conceptually speaking, they do not even live in the same world. Your, your work is a source for uncountably large number uh, your work is a source for an uncountably large number of relation, of such relationships and these relationships in turn are a primary source of the richness and complexity in your art 
as your art develops, conceptual relationships increasingly define the shape and structure of the world you see. In time, they are the world. Distinctions between you, your work, and the world lessen, grow transparent, and finally disappear. In time, trees are once again trees. Viewed over a span of years, changes in one's art often reveal a curious pattern. Swinging irregularly between long periods of quiet refinement and occasional leaps of a runaway change. And although and though it's beyond our purposes here, we can't help but note the tantalizing similarity between this pattern and the manifestations of chaos theory in mathematics. Okay. Sometimes our perception of the world flows smoothly and continuously from one state to the next, and sometimes it flips over unexpectedly and irre irrefragably into a different configuration entirely. As school kids, we memorize the famous examples, like Newton's apple delivering him the law of gravity, but always with the caveat that such events are rare, possibly excessively rare. After all, how often does anyone get the chance to rewrite the underlying laws of physics? Yet it's demonstrably true that all of us do, from time to time, experience such conceptual jumps. And while ours may not affect the orbit of planets, they markedly affect the way we engage the world around us. Study French, for instance, and you'll likely spend the first month painstakingly translating it word by word into English to make it understandable. Then one day, voila, you find yourself reading French without translating it, and a process that was previously enigmatic has become automatic. Or go mushroom hunting with someone who really knows mushrooms and you'll first endure some downright humiliating outings in which the expert finds all the mushrooms and you find none. But then at some point the world shifts, the woods magically fill, mushrooms everywhere, and a viewpoint that was previously opaque has become transparent. I wonder if there's something embedded in that uh, little uh, example there, but anyway. For the artist, such lightning shifts are the essential mechanism of change. They, that makes me think of insight. They generate the purest form of metaphor. Connections are made between unlike things, meanings from one enrich the meanings of the other, and the unlike things become inseparable. Before the leap, there was light and shadow. Afterwards, objects float in a space where light and shadow are indistingu indistinguishable from the object they define. Recently, a painter of some accomplishment, but as insecure as the rest of us, was discussing his previous night's dream with a friend over coffee. Cheers. I just, that was, I had to, too tempting. Um, I lost my place. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was one of those vivid technicolor dreams, the kind that linger on in exact detail after waking. I miss those. In his dream, he found himself at an art gallery and when he walked inside and looked around, he found the walls hung with paintings, amazing paintings, paintings of passionate intensity and haunt, haunting beauty. Recounting his dream, the artist ended fervently with, I'd give anything to be able to make paintings like that. Wait a minute, his friend exclaimed. Don't you see? Those were your paintings. They came from your own mind. Who else could have painted them? Who else indeed? Of course, you can deny your dreams, but the result will be uniformly dreary. Insist that the world you must always remain X, and X is indeed exactly what you'll get. But that's all the world will ever be, and all your art will ever be. When your only tool is a hammer, so the saying goes, everything looks like a nail. 
Imagination and execution take their rightful common ground in possible acts, paintable pictures, danceable steps, playable notes. Your growth as the artist is a growth towards fully realizable works, works that become real in full illumination of all you know, including all you know about yourself. Oh, I can't wait to get into the next piece. The Human Voice. And then there's a quote underneath that by Pablo Picasso. Computers are useless. All they can give you are answers. Okay. Okay, I'm so I'm looking forward to reading that. Anyway. Um, I just want to say that I hope you feel, or well, to this point, have felt a little VNA, virtually not alone, or VLA, virtually less alone. <laughs> and uh, I hope you know that, like, for example, the reason why I'm doing this is kind of like to contribute towards that or to give time and attention to you who might be listening and like kind of with the intention of almost um, trying to help or assist or give you something to digest um, or give you something for your attention that might be good for you and um, hopefully helpful in some way and maybe encouraging or inspiring and perhaps from this you feel like putting a pen to paper perhaps you feel like picking up your guitar perhaps you feel like picking up that paintbrush and just a little bit of paint and addressing that piece of canvas that you haven't addressed in a while or even maybe for the first time ever because you can think if you can think you can draw you can take a pencil and a piece of paper and just empty your mind and let that creativity flow everybody has got that great creative side and it's something that i do really really encourage to find and explore um it can really help with a lot of things um it really does help with life you know art is a is an important part of life art making and that's why this book is so interesting and quite relevant anyway i'm not going to go on and on <laughs> but most of all i want you to know that you are loved and if you haven't heard the words, I love you, I've just said it. And I want you to say those words for yourself. Because there are people around you that care about you, that do love you. And there are definitely people around you that you love and that you care about. I think it's time for that to be said more. Okay, ciao.